Um, <laughs> it's been wonderful to, to spend the last couple of months kind of finding out about the history of the site at Nanonagle Place in more detail through the work of um, Gillian O'Brien and Jesse Castle, who have been um, working on the exhibition. And, and tonight, we're just delighted to have John Scully, who's going to share um, more of that history, um, particularly of those first, uh, the first residents of the convent here in Nanonagle Place, the Ursuline Sisters. Um, and uh, John is a lecturer in theology in Trinity College Dublin, and he was a secondary school teacher for, um, for 20 years. He's the author of 40 books. Um, and of course, the book that is uh, so important uh, to us is Bound by the Bonds of Love, his book about uh, the Ursuline Sisters that was published in 2020. So for people who'd like to find out more and to, to kind of discover more of John's work, then that's the place to go and find it. Um, in the meantime, uh, we're delighted to welcome you, John. Thank you so much uh, for giving this lecture for us. And for anybody who um, has a question for John, if you'd like to use the question and answer box, uh, we'd, be, uh, we'd be delighted to pose those questions to John after the lecture. So John, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Danielle, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's uh, lovely to be here. I am joining you from Trinity College, um, mainly because um, I was worried about my broadband at home. Um, this is actually the first time I've been in the building for since the pandemic started, and I had to get a special dispensation to come in here this evening because um, we have, as you know, a lot of um, public health experts on, on staff, Luke O'Neill being the most notable, and they're all very keen on uh, people staying away from the college as much as possible, apart from the essential people like Luke, obviously. So, um, uh, so it's actually nice to be here for Trinity. It feels really strange to be um, to be back for the first time in uh, in eighteen months or so. Just to, to kind of say, I know Danielle was talking about uh, that you've had a lot of talks in the last number of months on history. Uh, just to to reiterate uh, something Danielle mentioned, um, I'm not a historian as such. I, I did this through my degree, all right, but I'm primarily a theologian. So I, I suppose I'm coming to the Ursuline story uh, primarily as a theologian with an interest in history rather than as, a, as an historian. And um, uh, that is explains, I think, why, for instance, my book will be quite different, for instance, on the book that came out recently on Nano Nagel, which uh, Presentation Sisters commissioned, because that was written by uh, an historian. So, um, you know, I, I um, be just just think it's important just to to kind of state that from the at the at the outset, because uh, one of the things we say in theology is we do not do theology from an innocent place, do not do history from an innocent place, and I you know I suppose it's important just to, to, to state that at the start. So, um, so basically what I'm going to try and do is share you a little bit on um, the idea of the unfolding story of the Ursulines. And um, as Danielle has mentioned, it's their 250th anniversary of their time in Ireland this year. So probably a good time to do so. And I tend to take things very literally. So when I was asked to talk about the unfolding story, I made uh, my PowerPoint um, on images of writing a story. And the Ursulines continue to, to uh, write their story. So before we uh, get to Ireland, um, they, um, I think it's important maybe to say a little bit about the founding of the Ursulines in general. Um, the Ursulines are actually uh, founded in Italy by a woman called Angela Morisi. And as you can see there, our dates are 1470 to 1540. Now, um, I should say that one of the things that, that I did when I was asked to write the, the story of the Ursulines and again, that's significant too, it's the story rather than the history, um, was to 
uh, to meet all of the sisters uh, who are able to to talk with me in Ireland, also in Wales and in Kenya, because up to recently that was the Irish province. And I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, in a little while. But what really struck me when I spoke to all the sisters and asked them to explain to me what it is to be an Ursuline sister in 2020 or 2021, they all, uh, without exception, uh, referred back to something about Angela. And um, as many of you will know, uh, during the Second Vatican Council, uh, a lot of congregations were encouraged to revisit their heritage. And um, the Presentation Sisters, I know, are very strong on that. And obviously, um, the Interpretive Center now is, um, a, is really powerful testimony of the importance of heritage in, in the presentation sisters. Uh, and the evenings like this are another reflection of that. Um, but I do think that the Ursulines in Ireland, in Kenya and in Wales um, have taken on many of the characteristics of Angela. And I just want to say a little bit about her at the outset, because um, I think to some extent, you know, she has shaped who they are and who they continue to be. So Angela was a, a woman who was brought up at a time of great turbulence in Italian society. And of course, many of you will be aware of the fact that uh, historically, a lot of religious congregations are found in times of great turbulence. So that is why, for instance, in 18th and 19th centuries, we see a lot of uh, new religious congregations founded in Ireland at a time of great turmoil in the society, times of the penal laws, great famine, a um, time of a lot of political uh, disquiet, uh, a lot too of social problems, particularly poverty. And uh, Angela came, I suppose, at a time when Italy was kind of going through a bit of a slump after the high point of the Renaissance, um, when, you know, Italy had been kind of seen, I suppose, as world leaders in terms of civilization. But unfortunately, as often happens, times of great height, there is always a crash. Um, at the risk of being facetious, uh, the Dublin footballers are probably a recent uh, example of, of that. So, um, in Italian society, in the early years of the 16th century, late years of the 15th century, there were a lot of social problems. And the divergence between the haves and the have-nots was quite pronounced. And Angela was someone who was very attuned to uh, the needs of the people. And, you know, I think that word attuned is very important to understand the Ursuline story, because there were people who were very responsive to the local needs. Um, in Italy originally, as we see in France, and as we see then in Ireland, Kenya in particular. So uh, she wanted to try and uh, respond to the poverty that she saw around her. And particularly, she wanted to redress or address the lack of opportunities for women in Italian society, because obviously Italian society was quite uh, patriarchal, uh, very macho, very male dominated. And I suppose uh, we could, at the risk of oversimplification, um, we, could, we could summarize Italian society at this time as the rich man was in his castle, the poor man was uh, at his gate and women and children were nowhere to be seen. And Angela was someone who in her own way wanted to change that. And again, you know, I think that is quite striking and it is something that goes to the heart of the Ursuline charism or story, that, that desire to, to kind of in a, in a gentle way perhaps, but definitely to challenge the social order of the time and to not accept the situation where women should be seen and not heard. And 
that is very evident today in uh, Kenya, for instance, which we'll come back to. Now, as Angela went about her business uh, and she tried to change, if you like, Italian society, she came to the attention of the Vatican uh, because she was seen as someone who was a great resource for the church of the time. And she was invited to meet the Pope who brought her in, um, gave her tea and biscuits and uh, told her exactly what he wanted and what he expected from her and told her where uh, he wanted to send her and the work that what she wanted to do. And to his great surprise, Angela very politely said, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Now, even today for someone to say no to the Pope is quite a big deal. But back then for a woman to say no to the Pope was pretty uh, unimaginable, uh, but she did. And she said, no, I'm going to do my own thing. And my own thing is to go back to my own part of Italy. And again, that stress on the local, the contextual, and not to deal with things in abstract, but to deal in a very clear, in a very specific way. And, you know, I, I do think that the Ursulines have uh, continued that tradition and very much are continuing that tradition uh, today. Now, I think um, it's also interesting and uh, important, perhaps, to refer briefly to the theological context at the time. At the risk of oversimplification, the, the church, Catholic Church, uh, would have been still uh, very much under the, I suppose, leadership spiritually um, of St. Augustine, even though he was long dead at this stage, a thousand years dead. but. He had had a huge influence on Catholic teaching, Catholic theology. And um, many of you know Augustine's story, which was that Augustine had a life of, we might call it wine, women and song. And then he had a famous conversion and he went from one extreme to the other. And basically, uh, I suppose he changed the whole mindset of the church because what he did was to establish uh, a very dualistic model of, of thinking. And that dualistic model was, I suppose, could be summed up in two ways. One is that this world is bad, the next world is good. Um, the body is bad, the soul is good. And that had a huge impact on, on church teaching for centuries, right up to the Second Vatican Council. If I might just give a small little aside, some of you might have been aware there's been a lot of discussion on a, a new uh, podcast that has been organized in America by former sisters of Mother Teresa, for instance. Uh, Mother Teresa is someone I would have known and had a contact with and I suppose have a, a, a great interest in, but um, she's got a lot of criticism recently for the way she ran her order but uh, I, I, the point I would make is that Mother Teresa reflected the theological context of her time. She was very much a woman of her time in the church. Had she been brought up, brought up after Vatican II, she would have a very different theological context. Now, again, what is striking is that Angela was brought up in this dualistic con uh, context, but in her way, in a very gentle way, broke against it because the model very much of this time was that religious women in particular were to, to take up the contemplative route. Now, there were obviously exceptions, Hildegard of Bingen, for instance, um, who went against that. Um, but by and large, uh, that was the expectation. The women like Teresa Valor, for instance, would go down the largely and temples of root. Although again, uh, Teresa Vavla is a lot more complicated than many people think she actually is. But um, what Angela did was to, to kind of say that yes, prayer is vital, but also what she was very keen on was service. And obviously uh, she was someone who looked at the idea of Martha and Mary in the, the gospel story uh, who is the most important, 
the one who prays or the one who serves. And again, Angela was kind of ahead of her time because she said, actually, it's not a case of either or, it's a case of both and. We should actually put it quite in those uh, sim simple terms, but that's effectively what she did. And, you know, many of you will be familiar with um, Richard Rohr today, who has this idea of active contemplative um, and um, in many ways, Angela was way ahead of her time because that was kind of the model that she uh, presented. So um, she was very much countercultural in the church at the time because A, she thought it was very important that women should not just be seen uh, but not heard anymore. She thought that women should be educated and they should get, um, wouldn't say equality, you know, would be mistaken to say she was a feminist, but uh, she wanted women to be brought in from the margins and into the center. And, you know, she was very much a pioneering woman. And I, I would think, you know, if I was to sum up the Ursa lines, that for me will be the phrase I would most use, pioneering women. And uh, that is, uh, I think, part of Angela's um, enduring influence. So um, it's important perhaps to say that um, they, I'm not sure, uh, sorry, if, um, uh, sorry, um, um, just go back here, just hit, um, in the wrong buttons here, uh, please. It's, uh, technology is great, but um, sometimes I've got big fingers, so it, um, uh, the slides just seem to have gone slightly out of sync on me. So I'll just go back. Let's go back to the start and yeah so um the ursulines um were a congregation that began in italy but they're probably their most important influence was actually in france and uh Whereas Angela had created a model of a church that was uh, very much and a congregation, if you like, that was very much based around service. It was really uh, in France that the Ursulines really flowered and uh, they were to have a huge influence on the Ursulines and in particular their education philosophy but also it, they were the reasons, if you like, why the um, Ursulines came to Ireland. So the one significant change though that happened in France was that uh, whereas Angela was very much the believer in service and being outgoing, um, in France the Ursulines went back, if you like, to the traditional place of women religious, which was uh, to be cloistered. And um, that, that would, would continue right up until the Second Vatican Council. Um, the French influence was also important in that uh, the uh, Ursulines took a fourth vow. You're obviously all familiar with the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but the Ursulines in France took a fourth vow which was to um, educate the young. And in France, the Ursulines built a great reputation for their education and their schools to such an extent that the queen uh, at the time um, came to visit and uh, enrolled basically Louis XIII, King Louis XIII to some of their classes. And I suppose it was, uh, I suppose, a sign that these women 
had made their mark in French society as really major players in the world of education. But, you know, for the next few hundred years, till Vatican II, if you like, the French influence took over in the Ursuline family, if you like, and right up to Vatican II had a huge inf influence on um, Ursuline education in particular. Now, um, I'm not going to talk hugely about Nano Nagel uh, because I suspect a that most of you are, are know a lot more about Nano Nagel than I ever will. But um, the the reason why the Ursulines came to Ireland um, in 1771 was because of Nano Nagel. As you know, this was a time of great turbulence in Irish life, uh, a time of great oppression in many ways, uh, a time of the penal laws. Now, at this time, there was very few opportunities for girls, Catholic girls, to get an education, and uh, the wealthy, many of them went, like Nano, to France uh, to finish their education, get their education. And obviously, um, because Nano did, um, she became aware of the Ursulines, and one of the conduits for that was her cousin, Margaret Butler. And um, Margaret, I suppose, was uh, an Ursuline sister in France, and um, Nano uh, became close to her, and uh, at this time, as you will know, uh, Nano was searching for a way of making sense of what her vocation in life was and how to use her gifts, how to use her privileges, how to use her money to try and respond to people in need in Cork in particular. And uh, so, um, um, she thought that one of the ways to do that would be to invite the Ursulines to set up a school in Cork. And uh, so Ursulines came from France to Cork. Um, they were described as uh, um, contraband freight um, <laughs> because obviously this was the time of the penal laws and they um, were um, not very welcome within certain sections of Cork society initially because certainly uh, some of the wealthy Protestant ruling class in Cork felt that the Ursulines would be a threat to the status quo in Cork and that they would be uh, a force of oppression, of division, of Catholicism, uh, basically everything that, that they didn't really want at the, at the time. And obviously, as we know, um, Ireland was very much a society of a them and us, uh, Protestants and Catholics. So, you know, it's very important from a historical perspective to try and understand, not just through our own eyes, but through the eyes of people at the time, why there was this hostility. So uh, this part of the story, I, I'm not going to say too much about, except that um, Nano was the, the founder, if you like, of the Ursulines in Ireland, because it was her work that um, her invitation to the Ursulines to come to Cork initially, and she obviously um, financed the, the schools initially. Now, if we like later on, we can come back and talk more about that. But I suspect that this is part of the story that most of you are quite familiar with. So um, when they came to Ireland under Nano stewardship and certainly critically through our uh, financial <laughs> benefactoring, if you like, they opened a boarding school, one of the first uh, Irish Catholic schools for girls. Uh, they had 12 boarders, and it was an instant success. Now, again, um, 
Nano, although she wasn't a disciple as such of Angela Marisi, um, was in her own way, I think, very much in the tradition of An Angela, um, because she too was very contextual. She looked around and uh, rather than making great sermons or pontificating, she kind of looked around and said, what can I do? What is there a need for? And obviously there was a huge need for education. There was a huge need for education of girls. There was huge poverty in Cork and in Irish society in general. And like a lot of religious congregations, their hope was that education would be, if you like, a silver bullet that would uh, gradually lift Irish women out of the terrible grip, uh, vice-like grip that poverty had on so many people at the time. So the first boarding school is open and it is a success. And again, I, I know many of you will be very familiar with the, the story of Nano in Cork. So I'm, I'm going to um, kind of glide over that for the moment. So after the Earth Alliance established themselves in Cork, there they were again um, very aware of the fact that there are a lot of other places that are in great need as well. And you know, this is one of the things that they again I think comes back to goes back to Angela in the Ursuline tradition, which is that they were very um, outward looking all the time. Uh, they were never kind of to say we're going to stick with what we have. We're, so they always kind of had a sense of there's more to be done. And where can we where can we go? Where is an area of great need? So after Cork, um, their next step was to go to Thurles in 1787. And a local girl, Anastasia Tobin, Sister Claire Ursula was a religious name. Uh, she completed her novitiate in Cork and she came to Thurles following her request from the Archbishop of Cashel. Now, um, this was one of the things that, that I, I suppose uh, where the, the Ursulines differed uh, initially from Angela in that Angela, as we know, uh, was not overly uh, perturbed by um, keeping on side with the hierarchy. Uh, the Ursulines were very much um, in the very much uh, mindful of the needs of the hierarchy. So when the Bishop, Archbishop of Cashel said, "Come, we need you," and again, the fact that he made this request is was in itself a huge affirmation for the work that the Ursulines were doing in Cork. Um, and obviously this was a time when uh, uh, the Roman church had a huge power uh, in the Irish church and uh, the Pope gave his permission. So basically um, Angela came to Cork and uh, from Cork to Thurus and she set up a school in a tiny thatched cottage which was um, the convent also for a number of years and uh, it was very fragile and the story was that um, if there was a storm it seemed that the, 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 the building was so fragile it would be able to blow uh, blow the cottage away. Now, thankfully it didn't actually do that. Um, so um, um, but uh, as things were happening in, in Thurles there were also uh, things were happening in Cork. I'll come back to Thurles now in a, in a moment, but um, uh, Black Rock in 1824 um, was purchased for the princely sum of 5,000. Now 5,000 pounds was a huge sum back in 1824 on a, a, 19, a 999 year lease. Um, so I think it again goes back to that dualism I talked to about earlier and the body being bad and this world being bad. Um, so when the sisters went to view the site, they couldn't do it on their own. They had to go with the usual escort of the bishop, the father superior and the chaplain. You know, I, I just wanted to be um, aware of the fact that um, 
that there was this very uh, strong hierarchical context, context. But the Ursulines, I think, as well as uh, being interested in social things, were really, really interested in people. Um, one of the things they had a great knack of doing was um, turning a blind eye. So a small illustration of that in the um, in the convent school in in Cork in Blackrock. Um, one of the things that happened, and this is a little bit further on, but um, they started to attract schools uh, girls not just from Cork but from Kerry, um, perhaps. Uh, well, perhaps wealthier girls. Let's let's be fair. So, um, one of the just a small little illustration of that the humanity that was there. Um, um, there was one girl who every week used to get two copies of the Kerry, the Kerry Man newspaper, sent to her. As you, many of you know, the Kerry Man is the Bible in Kerry. So, um, why did you need the two copies? Well, one copy was sent. Um, and on the outside was uh, the message, love from mommy. And then the other one came without any message on the outside. But what happened was that they, the one that had said love from mommy, love from mommy was actually written, um, sent to her by her boyfriend. And in the pages of the newspaper was filled with a long love letter uh, from the boyfriend to tell her how much he loved this girl. And that was the the, the carry man from from um, with love from mommy. The one that didn't come from uh, didn't have love from mommy was actually from the mother. So just in case you're uh, worried, um, after the girl left school, she married her um, her boyfriend from Kerry, and um, they went to live in the kingdom, and they all lived happily ever after. But the nuns knew what was happening, but again. They they um, they chose to um, to ignore us. So I think that's um, that is kind of um, sweet and and also kind of illustrates the the humanity of of the nuns. So moving back then uh, to Thoris. Now in Thoris, uh, one of the things that was uh, very obvious was that Thoris was a much more of a struggle. For Financially, financially for the sisters than Cork was, and I, I wanted just to pick up one incident that perhaps uh, captures the type of women that were in the sister that were that were in the Ursulines in Thoris. So, in at one stage, uh, the rumor went out, as we know at the time, Ireland was ruled by the English, and the English wanted to try and protect their uh, political. Um, influence in Ireland as much as possible. So one of the things they, they tried to do, they proposed to do, was to set up a barracks in Thoris. Now, when they heard this, the nuns in Thoris, all four of them at the time, were horrified by the idea because um, they felt that having um, A, um, men around the place, B, soldiers around the place, and even worse, God forbid, Protestants around the place, that it would be a threat to um, the moral well-being of their young girls in Thoris. So um, they decided that what they would do was to write to the British army and say, we don't want you to set up a barracks here. Could you set it up somewhere else, please? So um, you know, I have to, to uh, stress, these were a, con a community of four women. Um, what was their budget at the time? Uh, was it 4,000? No. 400? No. Four pounds? No. Four shillings? No. It was four pence. So this is, these were the nuns who were writing to the head of the British Army in Ireland, the head of the army that was, that was part of the empire, of the greatest empire the world had ever seen, in which the sun never set. And uh, yet, what did they do? They managed to persuade the um, British Army not to send not to send up a barracks in Paris. And I just have here uh, just a nice little piece of social history. The, the, the letter they got back from uh, the British Civil Service. A concern is fitting up at Thoris for the reception of troops contiguous to a school established by you for the maintenance and education of young females. 
that such a measure will involve the dissolution of so useful establishment, and therefore praying that the proceedings in fitting up the said concern may be countermanded. And His Excellency, having taken the facts therein, set forth into consideration, I am directed to acquaint you that His Excellency has been pleased to agree that the site of the intended barracks at Thoris shall be changed, and has issued the necessary order, orders to the deputy barracks uh, master general accordingly. So what I think is uh, significant about this, I mentioned pioneering woman earlier, but I think the other thing about the Ursulines is that they are very independent women, strong, independent women who have no problem uh, taking on the might of the British Empire at the time. So some of the people they had, um, uh, the sister of Father Theobald Matthew as, past pu as pupils, and then one of the most interesting people who was a student there was Margaret Aylward, who many of you will know was the founder of the Holy Faith uh, Sisters. So their influence was quite, um, quite uh, um, profound. Um, now just one of the, the other things, I, I mentioned two things so far about the Ursulines, pioneering woman, strong independent women. The third thing I think is really important about the Ursulines was a tradition of sacrifice. So in Thoris, for instance, during the famine times, the nuns wanted to make sure that their uh, students, and remember these were all, their schools were boarding schools, so that the students would have enough to eat. So what do they do? Uh, they basically starve themselves. All they ate was cabbage twice a day. No bread, no potatoes, no anything. Now, I was brought up on a farm in Roscommon. Um, basically, uh, three days a week, we had cabbage and bacon. Uh, the other four days, we had bacon and cabbage. But I can assure you that eating cabbage on its own is, is no fun. So these were, these were extraordinary uh, women who really sacrificed themselves. And this was very much part of the Ursuline tradition, uh, right up to, to very recent times, where they, they would um, kind of starve themselves almost to, um, to, uh, to make sure that their students wouldn't go hungry, but also their, um, they, they were able to finance buildings. Um, so once these things got so bad uh, financially that the Loretto's came to um, see if they would take over the running of the school. And a great story was that the founder of the um, Loretto's in Ireland, um, Mother Teresa Ball, came down to Thoris and uh, she proposed that they would take over, but um, Pretty much the next day she left and the great story was that she had a dream where um, um, Ursula and Saint and Angela kind of came to her and said you're not going to touch our convent and they basically scared her and she ran away the next day which is a lovely story but the reality was um, they are the Loretto was figured that'd be much easier if they found their own convent rather than um, try and uh, work with one that was there so I talked earlier about the contextual things. So um, just a small example of that. Um, as many of you will know, in rural Ireland, a great uh, Irish feature of Irish society was fit the fair days, where farmers sold their sheep and cattle. So one of the things that used to happen at first was uh, that um, you know, a lot of army people in inverted commas would come and include, it was also a great social occasion for traveling children. So um, when the uh, Ursulines became aware of the scale of poverty amongst the travelers, they set up in Thoris what was known as the Providence School to try and help uh, traveler children. And again, example of that kind of contextual imaginative local response that I mentioned. And, you know, uh, I kind of uh, presenting things as if it was all kind of plain sailing or from the poverty, but, you know, there were tough times and like the black flu, uh, 1918, um, swept through the country and, you know, 98 of 106 of, the, of their 168 students got sick, you know, and 
uh, two six-year-olds in a primary school died. So uh, they were not, certainly not insulated from the problems of society. So after, after uh, Cork and um, Curlis, the next place they or signs went to was Waterford. And they went there in 1816, and it was known as the year of the bad flour, which meant there was often no food. They couldn't afford the good flour, um, so uh, basically lived on, um, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the bad stuff. Um, and again, put their resources into their students rather than themselves. Now, um, I think uh, very important to say that uh, this kind of motif of innovation uh, continued very much in Waterford. So one of the things that the Ursuline sisters did in 18, 1818 was to set up May devotions. Now, we understand that May devotions are very are part of our tradition in Irish Catholicism today, but they haven't been at that stage. And in fact, um, it was the Ursulines who really kind of popularized that idea of the May devotions. So, and then they also then, uh, obviously a lot of Irish education at the time uh, was for much, until much later fee paying, um, but the sisters had a boarding school for, for students who could afford to pay, but they also then set up a poor school for children who couldn't. And that was a huge part of, of the Ursuline tradition. Other thing that the Ursuline said in Waterford was they broke the, the, glass, the glass ceiling with their emphasis on science and higher education for women. So they uh, set up a training college for secondary teachers. Um, they opened up the first college of domestic science in Ireland. And this was very much part, seen as a project uh, that a lot of the women would end up getting married to farmers. And when they did, that they would have the uh, skills and the, the, the broader knowledge to try and improve efficiency of um, Irish agriculture. So again, uh, very innovative uh, for the time. Now, just to, to uh, stress that because the Orsalines had this tradition of innovation, they attracted a, a lot of famous uh, visitors. So one of them was the poet Hilaire Belloc. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with his poetry. Some of you will know, for instance, the famous line, in all my walks, it seems to me, the grace of God is found in courtesy. So that is, you know, one of the Balloc lines. So he came to visit the Ursulines in, in Waterford. Uh, they had a, a great, I suppose what we call today a kindergarten school, and that had a great reputation. But one of the people who, um, came to the school in 1926 was William Butler Yeats. Now, um, I should preface this, that there is a small bit of debate about this, um, um, but basically um, after a visit to a school, a school in Waterford, uh, uh, Yeats wrote his famous poem, Among School Children, and he describes the visit walking through their own school room questioning a kind old wood in what in a white hood replies. Um, I'm sure you're probably all too remember, all too young to remember like me, uh, a book um, of English poetry called Soundings that, that I certainly did for my leaving cert. But that was uh, one of the poems I remember from from my um, uh, from my leaving cert. Um, so the Ursulines uh, believe it is about them. Some other congregations might claim otherwise, but I'm going to side with the Ursulines and say it was written about them. Um, now, um, they also went to uh, Sligo, very uh, complex journey. I, I'm conscious the clock is, is, is running away with it, or me, so I won't say too much about that, but they initially went to Limerick, then they went to Ennis, then they went to Athlone, and they ended up basically in Sligo. So uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, politics involved, but um, finally after they got to Sligo in 1850, and um, they, one of the things they did was set up a farm, and 
quite uh, innovative at the time. They had Frisian cows, and um, at the at the at the time, this was kind of uh, unusual because most uh, Irish farmers at the time had Herefords who were red and white, but the Frisians were black and white, and which has obviously reflected the habit of the sisters at the time. So this the story in Sligo was that everything in the convent is black and white, even the cows. Um, so uh, porcelains in Sligo then uh, differed because uh, in the 20th century, uh, as education is becoming more established for girls in particular at second level, um, they decided that they would um, set up a, um, a, a college, basically, uh, St. Angela's College, which uh, many of you will know was the go-to place to train as a home economics teacher um, for many years and still is for many people. Um, so initially they had uh, Candice Ligo as a Gale School, and uh, one of the first I mentioned earlier about the importance of science and innovation. So the first Irish uh, science book, Uliab Kunskola Nurnoga, um, was written by um, an Ursuline sister. And um, actually the first um, female winner of the young um, scientist in Ireland in 1966, appropriate enough, came to um, came from the Ursuline uh, School in Sligo. So uh, to go back to Cork, um, while things were happening in um, Thurles, Waterford and, and Sligo, things were also happening in Cork, and uh, as well as the school in Blackrock, St. Angela's School was also established. As many of you know, uh, the last few years, beautiful new school, St. Angela's has been uh, set up and their very first student was a woman who uh, called Mary Ryan, who was the first ever female uh, professor, not just in UCC, but in Ireland um, at large. And again, ties in, I think, with that um, thing of pioneering women and not just the sisters being pioneering women, but empowering others to be uh, pioneering women. So uh, just to say that um, obviously the earth lines were not insulated from things that were going on in society at the time. So for instance, we find out that for instance, during the, the civil war, um, there is the, the convent is uh, basically a, a casualty of um, the civil war and their shots are fired and uh, um, no, thankfully, no, nobody is, is, is killed, but there's a, the walls basically are, are riddled with bullets, but they survive and they rejoice by saying uh, um, prayers the, the next day. But just a small example of how the Ursulines were not insulated from the, the issues of the time. Um, as you know, Michael Collins killed in Cork. Um, the, on the pro-treaty side, he was succeeded by uh, Richard Mulcahy, Dick Mulcahy, and uh, Dick Mulcahy had two sisters who were Ursuline's uh, sisters in Thurus. And as you know, th this was a time of great blood, thirst, bloodshed in Irish society. So at one stage, uh, Mulcahy was on the run. So where did he go to? to um, Hyde, he hid in the attic for a while in the convent in Thurus. And again, I think it's kind of interesting that much later, when after the Civil War was over and after de Valera came to power, um, de Valera came down to visit the uh, Ursuline School in, in Thurus, and there um, the um, superior of the house, who was Richard Mulcahy's sister, um, introduced him to um, de Valera and she said, Mr. de Valera, meet my brother Dick, you know, so um, just an interesting little um, uh, map of um, the way things were happening in the wider society or impacting on the sisters. Um, 
No. One of the things that, that uh, is very significant about the uh, forest lines is that we, we mentioned now Cork, Thurles, Waterford and um, Sligo. So these great houses, as they were known in the Ursuline tradition, um, big houses, whatever you want to call them, um, were basically, if you like, independent kingdoms. And so Thurles did its own thing, Cork did its own thing, uh, Waterford did its own thing, Sligo did its own thing. And uh, there was really, really very little contact. They shared the name Ursuline, but basically there was very, very little contact between them. So in September 1948, the sisters in Thurles began a mission to Waterford. Now, what was quite a new, what was different, they had gone to other bases like in America, different parts of America, Canada previously, but this was different in that, although it was set up originally by the Thurles House, the Thurles House uh, invited sisters from the other houses to join the mission. And this was to become prove very significant long term because if you like it was the beginning of the opening up of a new set of relationships between the different houses and if you like it was the first collaborative project between the the new houses and in the 70s this was this was going to become very significant so um uh, in 1957 then the Ursulines uh, began a mission to Kenya and uh, this mission uh, was started initially by the house in Sligo, but it too uh, began to um, attract sisters from the other houses. So if you like the, the insularity uh, within the Ursuline family was starting to break down. And uh, this sense of, there's also too a widening of the lens. Uh, a new understanding of mission. You know, Jesus said, go preach the gospel to all nations. And this was something that the Ursulines were very keen on. So uh, that's one of the reasons why they decided that they would go to Kenya in 1957. Six, just six of them did initially, but gradually that number uh, grew and grew. Um, and um, in the, the late 1970s, early 80s, for the first time, the Ursuline sisters started to invite uh, young women from Kenya and older women, which primarily younger women, to join the congregation. And uh, now there's only one Irish sister left in Kenya. Um, all of the um, sisters are um, are uh, Kenyan sisters, apart from that one. So I myself visited the Kenya in 2019. Uh, obviously a real privilege, I, I suppose, uh, really re-energized me in terms of what I understood uh, of the church and I suppose reminded me, I suppose, of what the essence of Christianity is because here now was these young Kenyan sisters um, the uh, oldest sister in Kenya is at the risk of oversimplification, um, younger than the youngest sister in Ireland. Um, and just quite a culture shock to, uh, you know, in, in Ireland these days, a young nun is anyone under 72 probably, but in Kenya, a young nun is in their, in their 20s. So um, really had a huge impact on me. Um, uh, you know, so you know the Leonard Cohen song uh, anthem. He talks about the the light to let the, the the sorry the crack to let the light in. And you know, in Kenya, I saw horrific poverty, but I saw the work that sisters were doing, and they were the cracks that were letting the light in in Kenyan society. And the interesting thing was that they they instead of doing the work themselves, which is what they started off with in 1957 doing, what they were doing now was a wholly, totally different model of a mission, which was empowering uh, young, empowering women in Kenya to, um, to do things for themselves. So for instance, um, the school, one, their, second, their school in Waterford provides funds for the sisters in Kenya to uh, set up a project whereby um, women are 
in Kenya who are recovering from AIDS but do not are not uh, taking in alcohol anymore. Um, basically, they're given seed capital to set up their own business and just totally transforming the, the lives of these women. Uh, in Kiberia, the second biggest slum in the world, you know, they're doing the same thing to uh, set up um, cooperatives. So just incredibly uplifting um, work. And again, you know, sisters back in Ireland, schools back in Ireland, students in Ireland, financing things like breakfast clubs, scholarships. And I suppose in 1957, when the sisters went to Kenya, their philosophy was, you know, we stand before them. But now uh, their approach is, we used to stand before them. Now we stand beside them in order to walk behind them. And it's very much a model of empowerment. So um, in 1960s, Second Vatican Council happens, changes the way um, religious life, religious congregations think about themselves. Um, and the Ursulines are not um, immune to that. And one of the things they, they do then is uh, they recognize that actually we have so much in common. Instead of being the Ursulines in Sligo, your signs in Watford, your signs in Thurnus, your signs in Cork, let's just be your signs in Ireland, in Wales, and in Kenya. And we'll set up the, the, the uh, United Province, which is what they did in 1978, which, which was massive. Um, now, um, obviously, I'm, I'm racing through things here, but they, that was obviously a time of great grace for the Ursulines. And, uh, um, you know, they continue then to, to set up new schools and get stronger in their local areas. But um, to, to finish up now, just to say that the Ursulines are finding the similar sort of problems as um, many other congregations. So in Ireland, falling numbers, aging members, little or no vocations. Kenya is obviously an exception. A uh, declining number of people willing and able to take on leadership roles and I'd say squeezed by the call of mission on the one hand and the necessity of maintenance on the other. In other words, there are lots of things they'd like to do, but they haven't got the sisters to do many of the things they would like to do anymore. So um, in recognition of that and recognition that in Ireland in particular, there are very few uh, younger sisters think they have one sister in Ireland under 60 um, uh, and most of them would be significantly older than that uh, so to kind of protect their mission in Kenya in particular um, the Irish uh, sisters joined the Roman Union which is the family of the Ursulines across the world and that is part of their future. So to sum up, there's the lines, an unfolding story. What are the three key things for me? Pioneering women, innovative women, strong women, independent women, and uh, women who are see power as something worthwhile, not for as something to hold on to, but as something to give to others and basically uh, to help people to help themselves. So uh, I've talked for long enough. So on that note, I'm going to uh, shut up for a while and hand back to Danielle. Thank you so much, John. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, great, great. <laughs> um, so there was so much there that, um, that I didn't know, and I'm sure um, some of our audience members wouldn't have known as well. So thank you for a, a fascinating talk. I was uh, struck by the May devotions because they were very big here yep. in, in South Pres. And I wondered, you know, are there, um, are there theological relationships uh, between the Presentation Sisters and the Earthline Sisters, you know, uh, coming from that close relationship they had in the beginning? Yeah, I, I would say it's because of their, 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 that, that affinity they had and, and that joint link with, with Nano Nagel. Certainly in the, in the earlier years, 
there would have been um, uh, a, a theological uh, affinity and uh, a spiritual affinity. And uh, I suppose, you know, I use the word charism, that the, the Ursuline sisters in many ways would have a, a similar charism, self-understanding of their charism uh, th that the presentations would would have, which was understandable given the the, the links with 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 Lennon Eagle. Probably though, uh, would have been uh, again that that French influence is probably stronger, I suspect, on the Ursulines than it would be on the presentations, because uh, Lennon Eagle wouldn't have been the same, wouldn't have been as immersed there as people like Margaret Butler were, for instance. Mm. Yeah. Um, that is, is really, it's um, a really fascinating question. I know that um, the presentation sisters inherited the, the things that they call parts of the building from the Ursulines. So sure. the core and the avant core, like there's a lot of French terminology. Yes, yes, yes. You yes, know, yes, in, in, yeah. in the kind of the way they almost described the, yeah. the church and the buildings. Yes, so, yes, yes. yes. So, so I suppose they, they, they were, I suppose, external manifestations of an internal orientation that had been shaped by the French connection. Mm. And, and uh, you know, you can see when um, when you talk about the, you know, the the, the foundress of the Ursulines and, and their their kind of pioneering work, why Nan and Eagle would have been really attracted to them as an order to bring, yes. because there's a real lit, there's a, a clear, you know, sort of overlap of interest. Indeed, indeed, very much so. I, I, I think that that's all. And again, the the that thing about service, I think, is 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 particularly strong. And also, you know, meeting the needs of meeting the needs of of people who are who are very much on the margins of society. You know, and uh, that that sense that that uh, you know that. Um, you know, today we talk about the silent majority, but back then the silent majority were were crippled by poverty, and you know that they and again I think both the presentation and the Ursulines would have the sense of not so much the handout, but the hand up approach. You know, mm. uh, let's 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 help people, let's pick them off the ground, let's give them the opportunity through education to 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 forge a new future. And I think that's why, you know, I did mention things like the poor schools and the, you know, the, the things for travelers, all, all of those things would have been things I think that would have been that both uh, a shared tradition for the presentation sisters and the Ursulines. That's fantastic. That's a, a kind of a, a lovely point of connection that I'd, I'd actually love to know more about. Um, we have a question uh, which is from an anonymous attendee, but they want to know, would the Earthlines have spoken French first when they arrived in Cork and Ireland? Uh, they, they would have, um, they would have spoken some French and then some English. So they, the Earthlines who, who came to Ireland were primarily Irish sisters. So as I mentioned earlier, the the well-to-do well-to-do girls uh, at this time, many of them went to France. So if you like, the the the, the group of people who were sent from France to Ireland were primarily um, women who had come from Ireland. So they obviously spoke French, but they wouldn't have exclusively spoken French. And obviously, it made sense for them to. Um, converse in in their their local language. So actually, they would have spoken French, English, and Irish. Um, so um, it was it was very um, cosmopolitan, you might say. They were they were they were culturally sophisticated um, um, at, at their at the time. That's time. Interesting, isn't it? I suppose. And again, it's that sort of terminology thing. They certainly would have learned how to be religious in France. Yeah. So, so, so they're kind of their their terminology of, of their way of life and exactly. the, the exactly. habit and, and so many of those things would have been kind of French coming from that that Parisian training. Very very much so. And particularly, I think, uh, was perhaps as important was the educational philosophy. Mm. They, they had very much the, the, the Ursuline educational philosophy, I would say to this day, is inspired by that French 
um, that the French vision, you know, um, uh, 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 which is about, uh, I, I would say, being child centered, um, being um, uh, where the, the, the subject is very important, the content matters, but the, the, the ultimately the, 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 well, the child and the welfare of the child is important, but also understanding that if the child is to progress in their education, you know, they, they, they can't have a rum, uh, tummy that's rumbling uh, from hunger. And, you know, uh, even to, to this day in Kitali, for instance, um, in Kenya, you know, the, the breakfast clubs are so important. So before the school day starts, uh, all the children are fed. And to be honest, that is one of the huge attractions um, for sending this, the children to school in Kenya because uh, it, there is a huge absenteeism rate in most schools in, in Kenya because a lot of parents don't, you know, would prefer to have the children at home working on the farms um, and so on. But in Kitali, for instance, where they have their breakfast club, uh, this is the way of making sure their children are fed. So that 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 again uh, goes back to the kind of the, the French connection, you know. So that that legacy is very alive, and it was so striking for me going to Kenya there in 2019, you know, because it was like being in a John McGarren novel. You know, the the, the classrooms were literally identical to what John McGarren is was describing. You know, these big old-fashioned uh, desks and um, all, all of all of that kind of that that kind of thing but your the the Ursuline is very much I suppose the obvious word would be uh, to take a holistic perspective to know that you're you know if you're going to change the mind of the child you have to to address their 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 basic needs first and make sure that they're 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 fed and I, I, that was again something that seems to have been shared by the presentation system. Mm. You know that there was a school bun and cocoa for anybody who was hungry, right. because as you said, you just can't yeah. concentrate if you're hungry. You know, yes. so there's, there's so many lovely pa parallels and connections. The, the other thing I was really struck by was that um, the innovation, you know, especially around yeah. domestic science education yeah. and, and yes. that teacher yeah. training college. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, and the, the first school for domestic science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, well, I, I, I think, I, I, it really struck me as, uh, as well. You know, and going around and, um, you know, Angela was an innovator, um, but but I, I mentioned about the phrase breaking the glass ceiling. The the earth lines kind of um, had this sense of, you know, uh, some con some congregations are very uh, constrained by traditions. You know, this is the way it's done. Uh, this is the way it's always been done. This is the way we're always going to have to do it. Whereas the Ursulines know um, there's a real, there's a need out here. We have to meet it. Now, if we continue to do what we have been doing, this need will not be met. So let's do something. Let's find some way of doing this that we haven't uh, done before. And you know that that is that's so. Uh, embellished in the, the the tradition of the Ursulines, and again, you know, in Kenya, you were you were seeing the, the, the literally the, the exact same things. There was a local difficulty, and some kind of imaginative response was found to 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 get around it and to give a practical response. But so much of about it was, as I mentioned, countercultural because it was about seeing that it was going to be women who change society, you know, and if you want to change society, if you want to change the world, you provide women with more opportunities. It's interesting that the, the women are the people who have the influence on the children, so you're always catching the next generation. That's right, that's so true. Um, Victoria Ann Pearson has just asked, you know, she's just said, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. And I know that she is uh, working on her PhD on uh, Francis Moylan. Yep. And uh, she's really interested in um, Jesuit influences mm -hmm. on the French and the early Irish yep. Ursulines, especially yep. devotion to the Sacred Heart. Uh, have you encountered that, John? Yeah, I, I would say that um, they, I would suspect again that the Jesuit influence is is probably um, most um, reflected 
in uh, in the education rather than their, their spirituality. The, the, the Sacred Heart uh, uh, thing certainly was was a big thing in in the French um, incarnation of the Earth Alliance, and inevitably then uh, Irish sisters would have brought some of that uh, tradition back with them. But that thing of you know the the child centered education, if you like, um, was something that was also associated with the Jesuits. So uh, it is something that I talk about uh, that that um, that the, there were there are more striking parallels between the Ursuline French educational vision and the Jesuit vision of education. Uh, in terms of spirituality, the the Ursulines are kind of an interesting mosaic. They took a bit from here, a bit from there, like the magpie. They took a bit from everyone, and part of that would have been the the, the uh, devotion to the, the the Sacred Heart, you know. Um, and uh, I suppose they obviously Mary then uh, was a, a strong uh, woman, and that, that's why the whole thing of the May altars. But I think uh, you know, I um. One of the things that was, I talked a bit earlier about the dualistic kind of understanding, the dualistic model. Um, a lot of religious congregations, their strategy was to deny the senses, you know, the uh, sight, touch, uh, as much as possible, and focus on the soul. Whereas the Ursulines always uh, understood the importance, the value of the census, you know. So that is why, like things like the the May altar, um, you know, Mary, the, the mother, uh, flowers, all, all of that, those kind of things, and that 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 whole, I suppose, Marian tradition of, you know, uh, the fruit of the womb, um, connections, creativity, childbirth, all of those those things were very much uh, rooted in the Ursuline tradition in a way that they weren't uh, in some other congregations, which were, were suspicious of anything to do with the body. So, so again, they're quite countercultural in that respect. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. I'm like, we'd almost have to have another talk about it. <laughs> and you can see why they're then why they're innovating, why they're responding, and, and things like Montessori would have really appealed to them as yes. you know, something that's child-centric and about yeah. the senses. And just yeah. well, John, it's been an absolute joy to have you uh talk for us. It, it's a mm. making a lovely contribution to our celebration of of um of kind of religious life on the site to get this picture of the Ursuline sisters um as fascinating, powerful. Uh, early pioneers of education in Ireland as well. So, John, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who, who attended the talk today. Thank you so much.